Hi, welcome to this session about using an open source wireless protocol stack. <clears throat> At Aloxi, we offer vertical industrial IoT solutions specifically for the chemical industry. The use case which we're currently focusing on is about um, wireless monitoring of, of manual valves. We need to supply an end-to-end -end solution for our customers which can be deployed on-premises. IoT is inherently complex because you need a backend system, you need gateway infrastructure for the wireless network, you need embedded programming and wireless technologies. Here I'm reusing a slide of the Eclipse Foundation, which shows that IoT is basically three separate stacks and with different functionalities. There's a lot of generic components, which are critical for the solution, but not application specific at all. For a small startup company like Aloxi, it certainly does not make sense to reinvent the wheel. So making use of and collaborating with open source projects makes a lot of sense in IoT. For instance, if you look at the IoT platform, we're using multiple open source projects already, like Hono, Dito, and Vorto, running on top of infrastructure like Kubernetes and Postgres and MongoDB. So this is uh, fully based on, on open source software. Similarly, on the gateway side, we're using embedded Linux and libraries like PAO MQTT to communicate with Hono. And also we're looking into making use of uh, the IOFOG project to, to manage all the edge devices like the gateways. So quite a lot is covered already by using open source components <clears throat> from Eclipse IoT or edge native working groups. On the embedded side, you have open source real-time operate, operating systems like uh, Zephyr from the Linux Foundation and secure bootloaders, which are recently seeing widespread adoption as well. This session, however, focus on the wireless communication stacks used in the, in the sensor and the gateway. There are a lot of wireless communication technolo technologies I encounter more regularly, um, and there are different ways to compare them. Quite often the aspect range is used for this, so you can categorize the, the um, protocols more or less in, uh, in range. However, it's a more complex trade-off of which range is only a part. Other aspects include data rates, scalability, reliability, energy consumption, and topology. We will not go into a detailed comparison here. Instead, since this is a conference about open source, I want to talk mainly about what we mean with an open source wireless stack. There are different aspects here. Uh, of course, you have the, the wireless stack itself, which is uh, just code, so it's easy to open source, um, but you also have uh, the, the specification itself. For instance, is this freely downloadable or does it contain any proprietary IP which might prevent you from implementing it in an open source project? If not, can you test your implementation using interoperability testing? Can you then certify it? Can you participate in, in the new, new versions of the, the specification, for instance? Another aspect is um, the, the radio um, modulation and encoding. This can be either uh, generic uh, using free to use digital modulations, or it can, can contain proprietary intellectual property for, for coding, for instance. Lastly, you must also wonder who manages the, the, the network infrastructure and who operates it. <clears throat> a few examples to, to make this more concrete. Imagine if you have uh, a, a closed module of, uh, of any technology that's quite easy to, to integrate in your, your sensor application and it's also easier to certify. However, what if you have a new customer which, who is based in, for example, Singapore and the vendor did not implement a protocol for this region yet? Or imagine it needs to be updated because of legislation updates or security patch or new protocol version. Are you able to convince your vendor to do so? You have to decide here if you want to be dependent on an external vendor or not. <clears throat> Another example uh, is about LoRaWAN. Here you have already multiple open source stack implementations available. So that's a good thing. You do have a proprietary RF chip, however. 
um, and also a proprietary and pretty expensive gateway chip. Um, on the on the network side, on the backends, you you need a lot of network server as well, of which there are multiple commercials, but also open source options. The good thing is that it's privately uh, you can host it uh, in a private network as well, and operate it yourself. Um, so even if the the stack is open source, there is still some possibility of locking here. For example, in the previous generation of the of the the radio chip. It was possible to implement other protocols using using other modulations as well. So you could do multimodal things or switch protocols for devices already in the field. But the latest revision of, of the chip makes this already a bit harder. So what will happen in the future? We don't know. Sigfox is another example. Here you're not tied to one chip vendor, which is a good thing. It supports many generic radio chips. However, the modulation itself is still proprietary, but in this case, it is a software modulation, which is implemented in the closed library you need to integrate. So the gateways here are proprietary, and moreover, they're, they're uh, operated by a provider. What, what happens if it's not operated in your country? Or what happens if the, if the provider stops operating the network in five years? These are a few examples, and there are different levels of openness. And I think the choice depends on the type of company you are. So there's no good and bad solution here. But the choices and, and arguments are very comparable to what you would use, for instance, when deciding on using a gateways vendor management software or building or using something like IOFOG to, to, to build your own. Do you want to be required to deploy the vendor solution on the premises of your customer? And what happens if you want to change the gateway vendor in two years time? <clears throat> so this brings me to the next part of the presentation where I want to give a very brief overview um, of the Dash 7 Alliance protocol. For this protocol, the specification itself is free. The modulation also works on all generic radio chips and there's no special networking infrastructure, meaning the gateway chip is the same as the end device. There are commercial uh, uh, stack implementations, but there's also an open source one. So we can really consider this as an open protocol. It's an evolution of the ISO uh, 18000 7 standard, so hence the name 7, um, which originated from, from uh, for inventory tracking. Now it is extended for more general purpose IoT on sub gigahertz network, um, and it's focusing on mid range communication start topologies and private networks. The uh, open source implementation of the spec um, is hosted on GitHub and it's under licensed under the Apache 2 license. The goal is to be a reference implementation of the spec and portable to multiple platforms. It has a simple architecture um, where you have a, um, a non-preemptive scheduler uh, and a hardware abstraction layer, and you can plug in different drivers for, for different microcontrollers and, and radios. Um, there's also the concept of, of platform, which allows you to implement different board layouts and, and wiring. The network stacks are implemented as modules, so next to uh, Dash 7, it also has a lower one currently. There's a cheap off the shelf of dev kit available from ST Microelectronics, which contains everything to, to get started. But you can also use, uh, for instance, a modem uh, sold by uh, Murata, um, which uh, if you load the open source stack on this, uh, you can easily embed it as an uh, external uh, serial modem. Uh, for instance, the PCB below is uh, yeah, this, uh, this modem integrated on uh, the chip we use in our gateway. So what is the Dash 7 spec? Um, I'm not going to go into too much details here. Um, it's a pretty complete stack, which is fully configured through files. And the application basically on, only interacts with the file system. So we have this application layer API, which is, uh, we call it ALP, um, which is basically a generic API 
to manage the file system. So you can, for example, read files or write files or create files, but it also allows you to, to query. So you can, for instance, arithmetically compare the contents of a file. For instance, <clears throat> here you have a, a sensor uh, on the right um, where an application periodically reads the temperature and that writes the value to a file managed by the stack. And that is everything the application code does. Another device on the left can then read this file and will get the answer back from the dash seven stack. This is what we call pool communication. This is very RFID-like, where you have an, an interrogator and one or more responders, which you can uh, you, you request the data when needed. And the nodes will be ad hoc synchronized with low latency and then respond. Also, the query feature allows smart addressing. For instance, if you want to respond, uh, I imagine if you want only a response if, if the temperature is uh, above 25 degrees and if the sensor is on pipe X, for instance. You can also do push communication where devices will just push the data periodically or triggered by some kind of uh, alarm, for instance. And here as well for the application, it's just the same. It, it, it will write the sensor file, but the stack is now configured differently. Writing the file triggers an ELP command, which in this case reads the file and sends the results to the dash, the dash seven network here. And all this behavior is stored in files as well, which means that it's updatable over the air. It also has flexible communication schemes. Next to the, the standard sensor to clouds, uh, you can also do low latency downlink or device to device communication. Receive scheduling is an, is an important part of this uh, because radios, they consume a lot of energy while in receive, receive mode. So low power protocols try to minimize this. Many protocols like LoRaWAN and Sigfox, for instance, will be in, uh, in receive mode only um, for available for downlink communication only after, uh, right after an uplink message. Other protocols like cellular or, or mesh protocols, they have fixed uh, receive slots for signaling and synchronization of the network. On the other hand, Dash 7 is asynchronous, meaning all nodes will use low power listening to detect energy on the channel at a, at a fixed period, but asynchronously from each other. A requester can, however, uh, synchronize them uh, in an ad hoc way by sending a sync train and then sending the command. And this allows low latency downlink while still being very energy efficient. <clears throat> So if you go back to, to, to our use case in the chemical industry, um, of course, customers try to standardize on one network for all applications. It makes a lot of sense to deploy infrastructure once and reuse it. And they are mostly looking at LoRaWAN now since this has the most market traction currently. However, not all applications are a good match for the technology. LoRaWAN has an increased maximum range, but also has an impact on the quality of service you can deliver. Important to note is that there are only, at the moment, only small-scale pilots being executed. <clears throat> we think that um, Dash 7 is a better fit for the valve use case, mainly because uh, it can offer increased reliability and scalability. Battery lifetime is critical as, as well in, in the, the, the chemical plants because the replacement there is very, very expensive. Also, features like low latency downlink and flexible addressing are useful as well. The main issue we see um, with LoRaWAN currently in, in this use case is, is reliability when scaling. For instance, this is a simulation with 1,000 nodes sending every 10 minutes. If, if you don't request an acknowledgement from, from the network, there is about 30% loss in this use case, in this uh, scenario, I mean. Um, However, if you would ask for an acknowledgement for reception, then there's a 95% loss. So requesting an acknowledgement decreases reliability, which is very counter counterintuitive at first. Um, so uh, an advice you often get from, from LoRaWAN vendors 
is to not use acknowledgements uh, for this reason, but instead send every message three times to increase the chances that it's being received. But of course, it does not uh, guarantee you anything. So where are the main difference uh, in this uh, reliability at scale between LoRa 1 and Dash 7? Uh, it's mainly about there's a lower chance of, of collisions in Dash 7 because the transmission duration is a lot lower. There's less, less time on air and it also does collision avoidance. Also, devices pick a preferred gateway and adjust their transmission power just enough to be able to reach this gateway, um, but uh, which will decrease then also the collisions uh, on the plant as a well. whole. Because of listen before talk, uh, Dash 7 is less restricted in specifically in EU regulations. <clears throat> So gateway duty cycle limitations because of the of the regulations mostly and, and the lower data rate, together with collisions are the main reasons why reliable LoRa 1 does not scale. The Dash 7 maximum range is lower than the maximum range of LoRa 1, but enough for a use case like this where you have, for instance, in this, uh, in, in, in this plant where you have a, a gateway in the middle and different sensors in the field. Also, the cost of a denser gateway deployment is way lower than the cost of more frequent battery replacements. And lastly, the increased data rates make over-the-air updates actually feasible. A bit more uh, background is available in the, in the white paper. Uh, I will, uh, I, the last slide contains a link to this. So, but the conclusion here is that um, here as well, in this use case, uh, there is no silver bullet, and, and LoRa 1 is not a silver bullet for all applications. So what we recommend to the customers is that uh, for reliable monitoring, um, they use Dash 7, but we can use we can use third-party LoRa 1 sensors on our gateway as well. So we use multi multi protocols, multi modality, um, to solve different use cases. Um, also, we can use uh, we we can use the valve sensors um, in in LoRa one as well. But then you can you can um, have some uh, you um, <clears throat> you can um, adapt uh, the the there are different kind of trade offs to make there. For instance, you can instead of um, sending an alert when a valve is operated, you can uh, send periodic updates like every hour, for instance. So um, to come back to the to the beginning, um, we had here uh, a Dash 7 um, implementation uh, on the gateway and the constraint device. So if you look at the roadmap of uh, the open source stack, um, what we want to do in the next period is to enable over the air firmware updates using broadcasts. So you would broadcast an update to multiple devices at once. Um, and continue implementing the, the, the full specification and new revisions of this. Uh, we're also thinking about porting to, to Zephyr, uh, so the, the real-time operating system, because we can then reuse uh, part of the operating system and hardware abstraction layer and, and drivers, but also because it would, would lower the entry barrier and increase the visibility for us. Um, growing the community is important, and um, Related to this, we're also uh, discussing, proposing this as an Eclipse project. If we look at um, how we can integrate further with Eclipse IoT uh, projects, um, for instance, on the backend side, uh, we're currently using a mapper uh, software in between Hono and Ditto, which converts, which parses the ALP messages and converts the binary file data to JSON structure according to a Vorto schema. Um, we might want to implement this in a generic way using using a custom mapper engine for for Vorto. And then uh, other IDs includes uh, obviously using Hogbit for uh, for firmware updates. So if you have the over-the-air firmware capability, it would be very useful to use Hogbit to, to do this. Um, and then as discussed, also IOFOC for uh, managing the gateways in the field. 
then we we might want to look into uh, opening uh, open sourcing some some gateway software which can can bridge the dash seven modem uh, with Hono. So uh, it was only a very brief introduction into the protocol and the open source implementation. So I put some more uh, links here. Um, but for now, I will be very happy to take uh, questions. Thank you for attending. Okay, so uh, thanks for joining again. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them in the chat window. Um, I already received uh, two of them, so I will start with answering these two. Uh, so the first one is uh, about, are there any open source hardware radios you can use with Dash 7 or LoRa, or will I be stuck with proprietary hardware? Um, in the case of Dash 7, it's, it's using um, well-known uh, modulation techniques, so, uh, such as uh, GFSK, which are implemented by basically any, uh, any RF chip. Um, so the, the analog part there is, uh, you, can, you can just uh, use any chip there. Um, in the case of LoRa, the modulation is proprietary. So you're, you're there stuck with Semtech chips or uh, possible licensees of the Semtech chip. So I think a microchip has, for instance, a license on this uh, IP and uh, any other vendor can take a license as well, um, but that is proprietary. And then the, yeah, the digital part of an RF chip, um, I'm not aware of there, uh, of there being any open source one. Um, if you want a pure open source solution, I'm, I'm aware that uh, you can, you can um, get this by implementing in a software defined radio where you would have basically an analog to digital converter and get the raw signals in software and then do all the digital, um, the digital demodulation and the bit synchronization, et cetera, in, in software. So um, we, in the, in the university, they already use that to um, be able to decode um, multiple Dash 7 packets uh, concurrently on different channels. So that's a pure uh, software solution. Um, so yeah, that's the answer to this question, I think. Um, then the other one um, was about how sensitive are Dash 7 signals to interference? Um, so um, Dash 7 is, is pretty narrow band, meaning that uh, the spectrum efficiency is is quite good. So um, if there are any interference on a specific um, channel, you can always uh, switch to another channel. Um, also um, important here is that um, the transmission time is, is, is quite low if you compare it to other uh, modulation techniques like uh, or um, protocols like Sigfox or, or LoRa. So the, the chances of um, interfering are lower here. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? If, another question is, can you recommend good resources or tutorials if I want to get started with Dash 7? Um, yes, I, the last slides uh, uh, contained a few um, links to get started. Um, so you can look at the code of the open source stack, for instance, but you also can um, go to the website of the Dash 7 Alliance. There are multiple uh, videos of use cases. There's a white paper. Um, you can download the spec as well. Um, so that should get you started. Okay. I think there are no more questions at the moment. Um, if any questions would pop up later, I will be happy to, uh, to answer them uh, through the, the conference platform or through uh, mail or LinkedIn. Um, so I think I can wrap up now. Um, thanks a lot for joining and um, enjoy the conference.